Okay, and let's just go ahead and let's take a look at chapter one. And uh, I'll darken this front light, right? It's a little bit better to take a look at it. That's better? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at chapter one. And in this class, we're going to be talking mostly about government accounting. Okay. We will, as you saw when we looked at the syllabus towards the back end of the class, talk about uh, not for profit. Okay. Sort of those last few chapters at the end. Okay. But mostly we're talking about governmental in this class. Okay. Now, when we talk about governmental in this class, we are talking about state and local governments, state and local governments. So is the state of California a state? That's the easiest question I'm going to ask in this whole class. Is the state of California a state? Yes, it is. Okay. Is the state of Rhode Island a state? Okay. So when the state of California, the largest state, the state of Rhode Island, I guess the smallest state in terms of geography anyway, prepares their financial reports, they both follow the same accounting. They will both follow the same requirements when they prepare their financial statements. When Mississippi prepares their financial statements, they will follow the same accounting as California, the same accounting as Rhode Island. Okay, so we're going to be learning that. Local governments, for example, counties will follow the requirements that we're going to learn in here. So when San Francisco County prepares their financial reports, they will do what? Follow the same standards that were followed by the state of California, the state of Rhode Island, all state and local governments. Okay, city of San Francisco, actually they combine it, city and county of San Francisco, but a city will follow the same requirements that we're going to be learning in here for state and local governments. State and local governments, okay. City of Hayward, is the city of Hayward a city? Believe it or not, yes it is, okay. And so the city of Hayward will follow the same requirements that we're going to learn here. So all state and local governments, states, obviously, counties, cities will all follow the accounting that we're going to be learning in here. Okay, and there are what? There are thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, as you might imagine, there's only 50 states, but there are hundreds of thousands of what? State and local governments across the country, right? Okay, now you come over and we talk about special purpose governments. Now, special purpose governments have a special purpose, you think? Okay, so what happens? If we're talking about a state, a county, a city, these are all considered general purpose governments because they do a lot of different things. For example, the city of San Francisco has public safety. Does the government keep you safe? They try. If you make it home tonight, if the raccoons didn't jump you on the way home, then what? Then you made it home safe, didn't you? Okay, parks and recreation is something that the city may do. Cultural issues or things that the cities may look at, right? These are all general purposes. A city, so a county is a general purpose government. A state is a general purpose government. But some governments that will follow the same accounting as the states, the same accounting as the counties do, the same accounting as the city do, but they have a singular special purpose. For example, a school district. What is the singular purpose of a school district? Education, all the things they sing about in the songs. I believe the children are the future. That's the what? Single purpose of what? of a school district, right? And so if you have a single special purpose, then you are considered a special purpose government. So states, cities, counties are considered general purpose. A school district is considered a what? Special purpose because it has that one purpose. But all of them will follow the accounting that we're going to be learning through the first eight chapters of this book. Okay. Now you come over and, uh, well, before... I move on from this slide. Did I leave any government entity out in the United States? Did I leave any United States type of government entity out? I said states. I said, huh? I didn't mention the federal government here, right? Okay. 
we do not talk about federal government accounting in this class. Federal government accounting is a highly specialized accounting that is used by federal agencies that if I was teaching this class, what they call inside the beltway in Washington, D.C., I would certainly cover it because there's a what high probability that a large population in that class may very well end up working for that one government, the federal government. Here in this class, I do not focus on federal government accounting. We focus on state and local for a couple reasons. One, you may very well be on an engagement with a CPA firm if you were to go to one of the CPA firms in which you are assigned an audit of a state or local government. You're not going to be signed the audit of the federal government because that's done by my old office, the Government Accountability Office, or other things like inspector generals, different federal entities. And so I don't cover federal government accounting in this class. It's just state and local. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is that federal government accounting is not tested on the CPA exam. State and local government accounting constitutes about 10% of the financial portion of the CPA exam. So that is very relevant for folks that are planning to take the CPA exam, the state and local government. Federal government accounting is not tested at all on the CPA exam. So we're going to save ourselves some time here, not get into federal government accounting. It's just state and local government accounting. Okay. What was the question about meet the firms? Was there a question about meet the firms? September 17th is meet the firms. 9-17 is meet the firms. And what time? From 6 to what? So San Francisco State's meet the firm is from 6 to 8.30, you say? On the 17th? And you think you want to go to that is what you're trying to tell me? And this class starts at what time? Seven. On 917, this class will start at 8 o'clock. Work? Now, that means you have to go. And I will be there to see that you are there. <laughs> okay. Here's what's not going to happen. Nobody, this isn't going to happen. You know, it's like, uh, it's like Saturday afternoon and you slept in because you stayed out late with your friends. And all of a sudden you hear, <laughs> and you go, oh, I hope mom opens, answers the door. And your mom answers the door and they say, hello, I'm here to meet your son or daughter because we need them to work for our firm. We hear they're a real firecracker. Honey, your job is here. Okay, that's not going to happen. Okay, you're going to have to go and work at that, hustle at that to get the firms that are actively coming here to recruit you to understand what you bring to the table. And Meet the Firms is the classic place for you to put on the suit, show up, and go, hello, well, you know, I know everything about your firm. It's the greatest firm in the world, I know. I heard that you guys are the greatest firm. Not that one over there. Then you'll go to this one over there and you'll say, I heard that you're the greatest firm. Uh, these firms that are going to be there, they'll probably be people from the San Francisco office. But often, um, like you might be talking to, uh-oh, if I mention one of them, I have to mention all four because <laughs> if I mention one of them and I don't mention the others, there's a representative from that firm waiting at my house when I get there and they say, oh, you mentioned uh, one of the firms and you didn't mention us. How come? Okay, so if uh, you meet somebody from PwC, KPMG, Deloitte, EY, okay, uh, and your interest is in working, say, in the San Jose office, 
often what they'll do is they'll say, oh, okay, well, we'll forward your resume to the San Jose office, or here's where you go apply for the San Jose. So typically, they have people that are in the San Francisco office at, but that does not mean that that's the only office you can apply to by having a conversation with someone like that. And they have the, the CPA firms, they have, it's they call it meet the firms, but they also have corporations, et cetera, that all are recruiting here at SF State, government entities. Uh, one firm you might want to take a good look at, look at is MGO. MGO is the firm that audits the city and county of San Francisco. They audit the city of San Jose. They audit the city and county of Los Angeles. Uh, and so they are huge in the world of government auditing. And so since you're taking this class, right, I mean, use that, leverage that. Oh, I'm taking governmental accounting, and I never realized how interesting it was until I, you know, and oh, 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 oh. Okay. Yes, sir, John. It's accounting. Pretty much. I mean, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go. Okay. Uh, for example, PwC, and I imagine EY, KPMG, and Deloitte also have something similar. But PwC, um, I know because when I worked for the federal government, we contracted with them to do the IT testing. Um, for us, and so they would do things like penetration testing, that sort of thing, to see if they could hack in to the systems. And because we didn't really have the in-house expertise to do that type of testing, we contracted with PwC to do that testing. And so a lot of times uh, they're more interested in your athletic ability for that kind of thing do you, than they are your, you know, how many accounting. Well, they're going to still expect you to have the accounting hours and all that for the CPA, but you start to express an interest in something other than just grinding out financial statements and that kind of work. Um, there's those type of opportunities, but it's accounting. Okay. Uh, if you are in doubt as to whether you have the requirements to get the license, the CPA license, um, Maybe I'll do that for one of our classes, but I'm going to talk to uh, the chair of the accounting department, see if they want me to set up uh, where I can go through transcripts at a certain time to go through and see if you've met the requirements. Uh, let me caution you. Be careful about talking to amateurs about what the requirements are to sit for the exam to get the license. Um, I believe they should put a poster over there at uh, lot 19 when people are walking onto campus that say don't talk to anybody except this dude about how to get the license because I get people to come to my office and say well first of all I haven't taken tax yet so I know I have to take tax to get my CPA and I'm like no you don't you don't have to take a tax class so where are you hearing that well that's what my friend told me okay well your friend is wrong so if you want to bring your transcripts to me set a time uh, it's kind of like you ever watch Judge Judy you know when there's doing the hearing and the people start saying something and Judy says I didn't ask you that that's kind of what it's like when you come to see me okay because I'm gonna take you through and quickly go through and see what it is that we have and if I ask you a question I want you to answer that question and then we go through all that and uh, you know whether or not you met the requirements so that when you're going to meet the firms then you can say yes I've met the 150 requirements or I will as soon as I finish this semester etc because they are basically saying they expect you to have met those before you come on board in many many cases Okay, now sometimes I'll get students to say, well, you know, I'm three short. I plan to take a PE class to get that, but I don't know. Should I say that I've met the requirements? Yes. Okay, you don't have to sit there and, you know, say, oh, I haven't met the requirements because you don't have one unit of PE or something stupid like that. Okay, so if you're, you know, 20 units away, don't tell them you've met it. But if you're, you know, a couple classes away or something, say, oh, yes, yes, so I've met the requirements. Meanwhile, you're thinking, geez, I've better sign up for that salsa class, you know, whatever, okay, all right, so, uh, okay, so on 917, the class will start at what time, what time, 8 o'clock, and we'll get out at 11, right, no, okay, okay, we'll still have the, we'll still get out at 10, 
Okay. All right. So you've got what? You've got state and local governments, not the federal government, constitutes about 10% of the financial section of the exam, 10 to 12%, 10 to 12 points. That's why we will spend quite a bit of time with this. Okay. Now, towards the end of the classes I've mentioned, we'll talk about not for profit accounting. Okay. And if you're wondering what this thing is, I think it's a church. But uh, sometimes I look at it and say, no, it's a religious hat. Okay, so I'm not sure what this is, but I think it's a church. Okay, and we are going to study the accounting for not for profit. Now, we mentioned right here that not for profit entities are often exempt from tax. We do not get into tax issues in this class. Okay, well, I mean, we get into tax to the government is what? Revenue, isn't it? So we'll get into revenue recognition as the government collects tax, how they recognize that revenue in Chapter 4. But we don't talk about tax issues for the taxpayer. We're talking about tax issues that relates to the tax collector, the government. Okay, But not-for-profits are frequently exempt from tax. Okay, Now, not-for-profits do what? They survive on their contributions, don't they? Okay, So what makes not-for-profit and government accounting unique, the reason you have to have a special class on it, is that through the other classes, your intermediate accounting, et cetera, even your introductory to accounting, we were having you all hopped up on the determination of net income, weren't we? Revenue minus expenses gives net income. Net income flows into retained earnings. Retained earnings is part of the stockholder's equity, and the entity has increased its wealth, and we go from period to period trying to increase the wealth of the company. That's been the whole discussion. Well, when you're dealing with state and local governments, when you're dealing with not-for-profits, they are not there, obviously not for profit, they are not there to earn a profit, they are there to what? efficiently, effectively provide services, and if you're a government, to your citizens, if you're not for profit, to what? The beneficiaries, right? So the construction of the financial reports is going to be different than what you've been used to in your for profit and that we're trying to demonstrate what was money spent appropriately and so the structure of our balance sheet our income statement our statement of cash flows that we'll get to much later are going to be de designed around this demonstrating that money was spent for these intended purposes okay now the entities that write the standards for state and local governments for state and local government is the GASB, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, the GASB. Okay. For our not-for-profits, it is the FASB. Okay. So what happens? GASB writes accounting standards for state and local governments. FASB writes accounting standards for not-for-profits. Now, how does FASB end up writing accounting standards for not-for-profits? Well, we have the FASB, and FASB sets accounting standards for private sector entities, don't they? Okay, but those private sector entities can be what? For profit. That's what you've been studying for the most part. So when, I don't know, Chevron. Google, whatever, prepares their financial statements, they follow FASB requirements, don't they, because they're for-profit entities? Okay. But because not-for-profits are seen as private sector entities, okay, the March of Dimes, United Way, whatever, um, Habits After Humanity, pick a not-for-profit, they are part of the private sector, so FASB writes the accounting standards for them as well. Now, when we're talking about government entities, we have the GASB. And the GASB, we have what? We have state and local governments. Okay, but we also have government not-for-profits. Now, what do we mean by government not-for-profit? 
Well, let's talk about private not-for-profit. Let's talk about uh, Stanford University. Stanford University is a not-for-profit, right? Although, let me tell you, walk around the campus, it's, they don't sure don't look like they're not-for-profit, okay? I mean, if San Francisco State is a prison, that's a country club, okay? All right, so I always say uh, San Francisco State has all the design of, what, 1968 penitentiary, right? Okay, so what happens? You go over to Stanford, it's like, okay, don't. Don't step, don't, don't get the marble uh, that's in the courtyard dirty, whatever, okay? So it is still, though, okay, I'll edit all that out later. It is still considered what? It is still considered uh, not-for-profit, isn't it? Okay, all right. But they are a private not-for-profit organization, okay? Now, when we look at the government, okay, we take institutions like state and local governments, cities, counties, that sort of thing, okay? But then what? Then we talk about government not-for-profit like, where are we? San Francisco State is an example of a government, what? Not-for-profit, okay? Now, it turns out that all not-for-profit, all, I should say, government entities, whether state or local or a what? a government not-for-profit like a state university all follow the same accounting. So when we learn the accounting for state and local government, we're also learning what for a government not-for-profit, okay? It's not until we get to what the private not-for-profit when we get to these standards established by the FASB that we're going to have something different for a not-for-profit entity that we will have to study in the separate chapters, okay? Probably the only time you'll see mention of the federal government in here is just who sets the standards for the federal government. Is the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, FASAB, is the entity that sets accounting standards for federal agencies. So when the IRS prepares their financial statements, yes, IRS has to prepare financial statements, and those are prepared according to the FASAB standards. When the consolidated financial statements of the federal government are prepared, they are prepared for the um, they are prepared under the FASB, uh, FASAB, excuse me, FASAB standards. Okay. Now, who are the users of these financial reports of the uh, GASB, of the state and local governments? Who are the users? Who uses these statements? Have you ever looked at them? So are you a user? Yes, you are. Because the GASB has decided you are the user. They have decided that what? That the citizens are the users of their financial reports. Is that nonsense? Yes, it is. What are they, now you have to read them? Because GASB decided that you're the user. Now the, now the GASB just gave you a homework assignment. Hey, you're the user, so get busy. Get a reading. Okay? So even though they call out the citizens as the users of their uh, of the uh, finance reports of state and local governments. The reality is that the entities that are probably going to use these are entities that are in the business of issuing, buying government securities. Do state and local governments issue bonds? Yes. State and local governments issue bonds? Yes. Do state and local governments issue bonds? Yes, they do. And so if you were going to buy a bond of, say, a city, you might very well be interested in their financial report, right? Okay, so it's more investors, not the general public, even though they've called them out to be the general public. Okay, FASAB has done the same thing. They say the citizens are the users. I don't think anybody uses these financial reports. I know that Congress doesn't use them. Even though the reports are addressed to President and the Congress, they do what? They say, okay, push that out of the way. Uh, what policy is going to get me reelected? And that's what they decide to do. Okay. All right. So um, I don't know that anybody uses the federal statements, but they are prepared. They are audited. Um, FASB, who's the users of the not for profit financial reports? Okay. There's a rule that if you fall asleep, you have to give up your seat. Did I tell you that rule? Is that in the syllabus? If you fall asleep during class, you have to give up your seat. 
What was my question? Who's the users of the not-for-profit finance reports? Shareholders of not-for-profits? Okay, but who's the user of the not-for-profit, of FASB's not-for-profit statement? You're right. If we're talking for-profit, then we're thinking the users are investors and creditors, right? Who is FASB called out as the users of the not-for-profit's financial reports? Why do we care about who the users of these reports are? Why do we care? Why do we? You're an accountant, aren't you? Why do you care who your audience is? Huh? So that you're providing information that's going to be useful for their purposes, right? Now, even though I think they missed the target on who the users of the GASB statements are, we're thinking of citizens, right? Okay? When we're preparing those statements. How about FASB? Who are we thinking about? The not for profit. Okay. I have a not for profit. Give me some money. Huh? Where's the money going? What's it being used for? Is it meeting the charter of the not-for-profit? Is it achieving the objectives? Because I worked hard for this money, and if I'm going to give it to you, I want to make sure that I am seeing that you're accomplishing your goals, right? Okay. So when we look at the structure of the not-for-profit, when we look at the structure of the government, uh, state and local government reports, it's all about what? Citizens. Okay. And it's all about what? It's all about donors. Okay. Okay, good. So is money being spent for the intended purpose is what we're really looking at when we're talking about the finance reports of government entities. Is money being used for the intended purpose? Is it what? Is it being used in compliance with budgetary constraints, in compliance with laws, regulations, etc.? So if the law says that I can only spend $1 million on road improvement, what would you expect to see in a state or local government's financial reports? Whether or not they spent $1 million on road improvement, right? And if there was something different than that actual, you would expect there to be some accounting as to why it was different than what the actual was. Geez, you were supposed to spend 100000 what I say? Hundred thousand million dollars on road improvement. How come you only spent nine hundred thousand? What happened? Well, and there would be explanations in various documents that would that go along with the financial reports. It would say, well, we had to take a hundred thousand away from road improvement because the raccoons were attacking the students at San Francisco State, and we had to do something about the rodent rat problem, whatever at SF State. And we spent a hundred thousand on that, right? What would you rather them do? Take care of the rats or the roads? I think they need to do something about them rats because I keep thinking one of these times, man, these rats are going to run up my pant leg. Okay? <laughs> okay? Um, well, they don't have to spend a million on road improvement. They can't spend more than a million because the million would be the budgetary constraint on that. Okay, And if they spent less, OK. But in order to be able to spend that now on rat abatement, they would have to go back and get the law to be changed to say, OK, yes, we see the problem. Now we'll spend 100000 on rat improvement, on rat getting rid of, OK, and rat abatement. and. Um, then the financial reports, there's something called a management discussion analysis that will explain, well, the reason we started spending this 100000 on rats is because there was a rat infestation. Let me get off of the rats because that's starting to get a little creepy. Okay. Um, you know, there was a uh, terrorist attack. Uh, there was, you know, one of these shootings, whatever, right? So we decided to spend more money on public safety 
and we deprogrammed some money from road improvement because we had to hire, you know, 5,000 extra police officers to patrol the streets, whatever, I don't know. No, no, that would also require approval. You cannot spend money in a government unless there's an illegal appropriation to do so. So they'd always have to go back and go through the appropriation, the law, legal process to do that. But that change is the nature of the kind of thing that would be explained in the financial reports. Hey, you had programmed a million for road improvement. You only spent 900000 because we spent the money on public safety, whatever. Okay. okay, now when we look at the financial reports, we're going to have a financial condition statement and a results of operation statement. Financial condition is the same thing as a balance sheet, although we won't call it a balance sheet. We'll have a special name for it. And what? Results of operations is analogous to what? an income statement, but we won't call it an income statement because we're not determining net income, right? But the two primary statements we're going to focus on are the balance sheet and the income statement, right? And we're looking to see that we are what? Living within our budgetary resources, living within compliance of whatever the laws and regulations are. Okay. Okay, good. Now, this concept of interperiod equity. And interperiod equity says that you should not spend more money than you take in in any one accounting period, we'll say in any one year. You should not spend more money than you take in. That's called interperiod equity because if you spend more money than you take in, that means you had to borrow money. That means you have what? Incurred debt that will have to be paid by future periods, future generations, whatever, right? Okay. So many state and local governments will try to live within this constraint of interperiod equity. In other words, they will balance their budget. They will balance their budget. Now, can you think of a government entity that spends more than it takes in? Federal government spends more money than it takes in every year and they have been doing that since about 1980 they've been doing that since about 1980 they have more money than they take in they spend more money than they take in their revenues their expenses exceed their revenues year after year after year after year after year and so they have to borrow money to operate so if you borrow money to operate for what, 40 years, basically is where we are now, what happens if you have to borrow money year after year after year? Interest rates haven't necessarily increased. It piles up and we call that, well, deficit is what happens in any one year. So in any one year, the federal government says, okay, we're taking in $300 million, $300 billion, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, $300 billion we're going to take in in a particular year, 2.5 billion is probably more like it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're going to take in revenue of 2.5, but we're going to expend 3 billion. So what do you end up with? You end up with a deficit of what? 500,000? And say this is 2019. Then what? In 2020, you do that again. You did, you did this in 1980. You did this in 1981. You did this in 1982. You did this in 1983. You did this in 1984. You did this in 1985. 86, 87, 89, 2020. You did it again. As that piles up, that is called debt. Just like if you have a credit card and you keep charging on a credit card period after period, you end up with a debt, don't you, on that card? 
Okay, so what is the federal debt? The deficit is what happens in any one year. What is the federal debt as we speak? How much? Huh? What do you say? You want to let's say twenty-three trillion. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twenty-three trillion. Somebody look it up. If I, if you want to, you don't have to. If you want to look it up, if I'm low, probably by the end of the class I'll be right. Okay, so it's about twenty-three trillion dollars. Okay, now. If we're going to blame Trump for that, because Trump has added to that, then we'll go ahead one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We'll blame Obama for what it was when Trump got in. And if we're going to blame Obama for what it was when he uh, when he got out of office, then we're going to blame Bush, the son, for $10 trillion. We'll call him Bush, too. Okay? We're going to blame Clinton, the husband. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oops. 10, 11, 12. Sorry, I forgot three zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, we're going to blame uh, Clinton, The I guess we'll just say Clinton. Uh, we didn't get Clinton, too. Okay, so we're going to blame Clinton for $5 trillion. Um, when Clinton got in, it was already $3.5 trillion. We'll blame that on Bush the father. When Bush the father got in, it was about 1.5 trillion. So we'll blame that on Reagan. Now you sit there and you say, well, what about all the other presidents before that? The debt was rarely above 500 billion dollars prior to Reagan. Okay, and it would go up during times of war and stuff like that, and then it would get paid back down. Okay, so it generally stayed fairly low. But around this time, everybody started saying, well, let's have our cake and eat it too. Let's have tax cuts and let's go bomb somebody. Let's have tax cuts and let's go bomb somebody. Let's have tax cuts and let's go bomb somebody. Let's have no tax cuts. But let's see if we can get our way out of this mess that we're in at this point. So let's institute a bunch of different programs that will help do stupid things like help people keep their homes and stuff like that. Okay. And then let's go ahead and cut taxes and let's go bomb somebody. Build a wall. Build a wall. There you go. So the trend has been what? Keep increasing this. Every time. So they try to say that it's just the one person that's done it all. Meanwhile, they all take their turn. Because they can't live with the political reality, the hard decisions like raising taxes or cutting, cutting expenses, right? And so they have their cake and they eat it too. They keep spending more. And they do what? Keep the taxes fairly low. Okay. So what's my point here? Some people believe that they started doing this on purpose so that the more and more debt you get, the more and more interest you have to pay, the more and more interest you have to pay, the less money that's available to spend on all these annoying programs. Who buys these securities? Who buys the debt? Well, they say that. I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows if other countries buy the debt. Okay, Most of the federal debt is taken down by the Bank of New York and Chase. They take it down. Those two banks take it down. They buy the debt from the government. And then they turn around and on the secondary market do what? Offer that to entities that want to buy the Treasury securities. But they don't have to tell the federal government who those 
individuals are because now that money's in the private sector, isn't it? So the federal government throws a debt party every Thursday. Well, they issue them, they auction them on Tuesday. So I guess the party's on Tuesday. They issue the securities on Thursday, but the federal government never actually knows who ultimately ends up holding that debt. Do you own any? Do you own any? No, I don't own any of those. So I'm thinking it's fairly what? Fairly rich individuals, fairly well-to-do individuals that are buying those securities, holding those securities, and getting the interest, interest that gets paid to those individuals that then what? Isn't available for different programs? I don't know. That was what some people described as the strategy that's been going on since they started mounting this debt like this. I don't know. Okay. Uh, federal government does not know who buys those securities. And then they all the time say, back in the back in the 80s, it was, oh, Japan's buying them. And Japan is going to own America. And when that didn't sound scary enough anymore, now it's, oh, it's China. China is buying them. Meanwhile, they don't know who's buying them. They don't know. All those numbers that they give, oh, China buys this much, all that, that's all funky estimates. If you look at um, estimates of who owns the federal debt, you will see all these different listings of these different countries that own federal debt, all with a different source. Shouldn't it be the same source? I mean, if I sit here and I get this from this reporting entity and this from this reporting entity saying who owns what, I bet you if I add those all together, it's more than the total of the debt. So where are they coming up with those numbers? If that number was reliable, it should be a single source. Yes, sir. Is there any benefit for individuals to buy the treasuries and bonds or whatever from the banks as opposed to directly from the government? No. Um... They have something called Treasury Direct, where you can buy the securities directly um, from the government. Um, but usually, those tend to be smaller investors. The large institutional investors tend to buy it from Chase, from Bank of New York. I don't know. Whoever these individuals are that are buying it, we don't know. We, the federal government can't go to Chase and say, who bought the securities? Who? For the investor? Interest. Interest. Have you heard of bonds before? Do bonds pay interest to the holders of the bonds? Okay. In America, no money is loaned without interest being paid to the individual that loaned the money out. Okay, so if you buy a government bond, you're loaning the government your money. The government's going to pay you interest, and of course, they have to pay your principal back, right? So the federal government's got to pay interest on those to whoever holds that bonds. And I think the interest, I want to say it was $300 billion. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That was the interest on the debt? Huh? No. Oh, three trillion? No, no, no. It's not three trillion. The interest? No. There's no way the interest is three trillion. I think it was three hundred billion is the interest, or three hundred million. Maybe it's three hundred million. One, two, three, four, five, six. Interest on the federal debt is not three trillion dollars. Huh? Not interest. You mean the total expenditures is three trillion? No way. There's no way that's right. I'm not sure what you're looking at. There's no way that they had to pay three trillion dollars in interest. They don't even collect that much in tax. Oh, okay. Since the debt started, but in any given year, it's more like three hundred. I want to say 300 million is what it is in any given year, the interest. But yeah, oh, oh, definitely over the course of however many years, 200 plus years, it might be three, three trillion, sure.
that's that's but not in any one given year in any one given year it's more like 300 million but they have to pay that interest to those individuals that hold those bonds right okay all right now here's another trick they like to play have you ever heard of the debt ceiling okay what the federal government has is a law in which they say the debt cannot be more than 25 trillion I don't know what the current debt ceiling is but they'll set a ceiling they'll say the debt cannot be more than 25 trillion that's as high as it can go let's say they say that I don't know that that's what the current ceiling is but let's say they say that's the ceiling now Right now, let's say we're at 23. Are we below the ceiling? Are we below the ceiling? Okay. Then what they'll do is they'll pass a budget and they'll say the budget is for, I don't know, we'll say um, let me make that number closer. Let me make this, uh, instead of making it 25, I'll make it Okay, 24 trillion is the ceiling. And then they'll come over and they'll say, okay, our revenue is going to be 3 trillion. Um, but our expenses are going to be uh, 5 trillion. Just to make this up. So that's going to create a deficit of how much? That's going to create a deficit of $2 trillion, isn't it? So when I add the deficit, say this is 2020, to the debt that's currently, which is 23, am I going to go over the ceiling? So they pass a budget which is a legal appropriation that is what directly a counter to another law that says that you can't spend more you can't amount debt more than 24 trillion so they pass a legal budget that says we are supposed to spend more than another law says we can spend to add to this and so they get closer and closer to this number and when they get closer and closer to this number as the year progresses then all of a sudden they start saying oh I don't want to increase I don't want to go over the debt ceiling the people who want to go over the debt ceiling are irresponsible individuals meanwhile the person that's saying that is the same person that what participated and signed a budget that guaranteed that you would go over that number are they playing with you? Are they playing with you? They absolutely are. They're sitting there and they start saying all kinds of things. Oh, well, you know, there's a, this is a budget that already passed it. They knew when they passed it, it would take them over the debt ceiling so that they knew they could do that political theater on you a couple years or a year down the line or whatever it was. Now, you're not going to see that this year because they raised the debt ceiling sufficiently so this nonsense is going on during the election because they don't want some weird thing like that to happen during the election because then all of a sudden oh, oh, oh what the government's shutting down while we're deciding to have an election okay so they play all kinds of little games you'll see people say we're going to have a balanced budget amendment balanced budget amendment is saying that we will amend the Constitution to require that the federal government not spend more than it takes in in any one given year. How do you amend the Constitution? How do you amend the Constitution? Just take out an eraser and go, well, let's see. 
Uh, Tenth Amendment. We don't need that anymore. Got an eraser? Here, just give me some white out. How do you amend the Constitution? Oh, let's add an amendment. Let's add a balanced budget amendment. You got a pen? How do you add, how do you amend the Constitution? First, you got to get the Congress to agree. The Senate and the House. <laughs> Already har har. Like that's going to happen. Like they agree on anything anymore. So first they got to agree, and then the president has to agree. So you got to get through the federal political process. But then what? Supreme Court, no. All the Supreme Court could do is say that an amendment is not constitutional, but you'd have to pass it first in order for them to say that it's not constitutional. The states have to ratify, so you have to get what? You have to get two-thirds of the state's legislatures to pass it by 50% majority, right? State by state, okay? So let's say all of the federal stuff happened. Now we're going to go to the states and say, okay, pass this that we have to balance the federal budget. Now, do state and local governments get money from the federal government? A lot. A lot. In fact, I always laugh. They sit there and they say, oh, yes, California, you know, California is a state. They don't, you know, they don't care. They don't, they're all crazy liberal out there spending all our money. Meanwhile... California pays what? More in taxes than we get in federal benefits. The states that say, cut all them benefits are the ones that get what? That get more federal benefits than they pay in taxes. If, if you looked at the arguments that are made, the blue states should be red and the red states should be blue. Okay, but anyway, what was I saying? So all the states would have to ratify, not all of them, but um, two-thirds of the states would have to ratify that by 50% majority. So let's say they ratify it. Now they've opened up the federal government to say, well, you said we have to balance the budget, so the states want that, so cut out the funding to the states. So the states would be out of their minds to ratify such an amendment. So is this ever going to happen? Will there ever be a balanced budget amendment? Never. So when you see a politician that stands up to you and says, I'm in favor of a balanced budget amendment, you can be a genius and go, he's lying. He's lying. How do you know he's lying? Look at it. His mouth is moving. He's lying. Okay, so, but balanced budget amendment supports the idea of what? Of interperiod equity, or a unicorn could come down and balance the budget for us. One of those two things will happen. Okay, okay, good. When we're talking about not for profits, we are interested in seeing how my donation was spent. I mean, that's what all this slide is saying that I wrote down here at the bottom. Conclusion is what? How will you spend my contribution, right? Okay, good. All right, we're not going to say much more about uh, not-for-profits, guys, until much, much later in the class. So now we're going to focus on the financial reporting of state and local government. Okay? All right, and we're going to start with this chart, which is a high-level look at the financial information that all state and local governments have to provide. So if you pick up the city, um, the state of California's financial reports, it'll have this information. If you pick up the city of Hayward's financial reports, it'll have this information. Okay, now you've noticed I've numbered these things one, two, three. Notice I've numbered them one, two, three. And I've done this because I am numbering them in the order in which you will see this information. So when you pick up the financial report of a state or local government, State of California, City of Hayward, City and County of San Francisco, the first thing you will see is the management discussion and analysis, MDNA. MDNA is the first thing you will see. Management discussion and analysis. It's the first thing you'll see. The second thing you will see is something called the basic financial statements. 
basic financial statements. Now, the basic financial statements are constituted of the government-wide statements and the individual fund statements and the notes there too. Notes are always an integral part of any set of financial statements. Now, what happens? What the government does is it prepares these fund statements, and there are 11 different funds that we're going to start to talk about in this chapter and focus even more in on chapter two. There are 11 different funds that we will prepare financial statements for, and then we will take those funds and we will consolidate them into a set of government-wide statements. It is just like you have company A and company B. You can, under common ownership, you consolidate company A, company B into a set of company-wide statements, right, John? Accounting 501? Okay. That process that you learn in advanced accounting and consolidating is what the government will do. They will take all of these funds and they will consolidate them into government-wide. Now, unlike in the case of a consolidation for a corporation, where you don't really see all the detail of the individual companies that constitute the consolidation, with government entities, state and local, you will see the additional detail. You will see all that detail that constitutes those funds, and then you'll see how they consolidate up into the government wide. That's why we have this arrow pointing back and forth and that what? Government is required to show you the connection between this individual disaggregated information and the government-wide statements. So these fund statements are really providing additional, that says, additional detail. They're providing additional detail. They're giving you all the detail that constitutes what? They then consolidated government-wide statements. Okay. Now, before you panic and think, John, are we going to have to perform a consolidation of funds and do eliminating entries and create a consolidated set of statements? No. I'm not going to expect you to do that, but I am going to expect you to understand the report that governments have to provide that show how you reconcile from the fund statements to the government-wide. So we won't have to actually do the consolidation, but there is a financial report that shows that, consolid shows that connection, I should say, between the two, and that you will have to understand. We'll get to that much later, Chapter 8, because I have to teach you about all the funds before I can show you how you then connect the funds to the government-wide statements. Okay, so the first thing I see is the MDNA. Second thing I see is what? The basic financial statements, which is the government-wide statements, the fund financial statements, and the notes there too. I'm going to have to be able to show how they connect up to each other, right? The fund statements being consolidation of the government, uh, the government-wide, I should say, being consolidation of the fund statements. The bottom box here, the third thing I'll see is required supplemental information other than the MDNA. Now, required supplemental information other than the MDNA right away tells you that the MDNA is what? Is required supplemental, supplemental information, isn't it? If the bottom box is required supplemental information other than the MDNA, then the MDNA by logic must be what? must be required supplemental information. Okay. Now, what does the word required mean? It must be provided. Good. Thank you. I asked that question the other night. Somebody said that means it's optional. No. <laughs> that means it's required. All right. Give that kid a special test. Get him out of here. Okay. All right. So what happens? Required means what? That you have to do it, right? You must do it, okay, so it's required. What does supplemental mean? Huh? Additional, right? Hey, you got to, we want some muscles, you got to take a supplement, right? You got to add to things, right? Okay, so what? It's adding to the normal, isn't it? To the other stuff, okay? What's the other stuff? What's the only other thing that's up here? If MDNA is required supplemental information and the required supplemental information other than MDNA is required supplemental information, what's the only other thing that's left? 
the basic financial statements. So the required supplemental information is supplementing what? The basic financial statements, isn't it? So the MDNA is a financial document. MDNA is not saying, you know, if you look at San Francisco at a certain time of night, you can literally see pastels in the clouds as it shines on the Golden Gate Bridge. That is not what the MDNA is saying. The MDNA is saying, we only spent $900,000 on road improvement because the rats were killing the kids at San Francisco State and we had to stop it. It's a financial document, isn't it? So it's explaining in words why we only spent a hundred, uh, whatever it was, nine hundred thousand instead of a hundred thousand on road improvement, right? Yes, sir. How's that different from the like the notes to the financial statements? Notes to financial statements say things like this: the accounting policies that we use for our governmental funds are modified accrual accounting. The um, Bonds are constituted of um, three, five, and ten-year bonds. So it's explaining the numbers in the financial statements where the MDNA is talking about financial opportunities, financial challenges, reasons for the difference between the budget and the actual, etc. So what notes do is make the numbers in the financial statements more understandable. The MDNA is management explaining their financial situation to you and giving them a chance to have that voice. And we're going to talk more about the specifics of the MDNA later, but that's a good question. Now, required supplemental information other than MDNA comes after the financial statements. That's where we may literally show you a side-by-side, -side, column by column comparison of the budget to the actual for each of the line items. So we'll be showing you what uh, that hundred thousand dollar difference and then the what what that's all about, the details to why that happened is written in prose in the MDNA, right? Okay? So the only difference between what? between the MDNA and the required supplemental information other than MDNA is they want you to see the MDNA first, don't they? First they want you to look at that and then they want you to see the financial statements and then they want you to see some of this additional detail, well I should have called, call it additional detail, but some of this additional information that what, that sort of shows you tables and that sort of thing as to some differences between budget and actual, etc. So the MDNA is a written document that you can read that GASB says you're supposed to read because you're a citizen, aren't you? Question? Okay. Now somebody said, you know, I don't know what's important and what's not important in your lectures. So those are stars saying this is important. You must know this. Multiple choice question on your exam. The city of Hayward has prepared its financial reports for the year 2020. Which of the following would be the first thing that you would see? MDNA. Which of the following would be contained in the financial reports of the state, uh, city of Hayward? Um, comparison of, let's see, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a bunch of things that wouldn't be included. Uh, answer D, MDNA. Answer that question is what? D, because I can't think of three other <laughs> things that wouldn't be included right now. Note to self, figure that out before you start that example question. Okay? So you're going to have to know that to be able to answer questions of that nature. Okay, good. Now, we are going to talk about our government-wide statements first here. Government-wide statements, there are two of them. Government-wide statements, there are two of them. One is called a statement of net position. The other is called a statement of activities. Okay, now, the government's net position is on the balance sheet. The change in net position is on the income statement, isn't it? 
we could call the income statement the change in retained earnings statement, couldn't we? Forgetting about dividends. Say there was no such thing as, about, as dividends. Then we could call the income statement the change in retained earnings statement, don't we? We don't call it that. We call it the income statement. Income, what adds to retained earnings, dividends, subtract from retained earnings, and we report that in the statement of retained earnings. Do governments pay dividends? Do governments issue stock? They do not, although who knows? Maybe Trump will say, hey, Iceland, I'll tell you what. I'll give you so many shares of U.S. stock, you give us Iceland, right? Okay, in a non-monetary exchange. No. Okay. So that's not supposed to happen. Okay. So governments do not issue stock, right? So there's no dividends. So when we get to the income statement, we call it the change in net position. Net position, therefore, must be like the retained earnings of this government, right? So when we think about a government's balance sheet, the government's balance sheet is going to be what's your favorite song? Assets equal what? <laughs> liabilities plus, right? But instead of saying stockholders' equity like you would for a corporation, instead we're going to say what? We're going to say net position. Do governments have stock? So net position basically comes down to being what? What's RE? Net position is like the retained earnings of this government, isn't it? Because there is no common stock as part of our stockholders equity. There is no additional paid in capital. There's only what? Retained earnings, right? Okay. So we report what? We report our net position on the balance sheet. Our change in our net position, our retained earnings, is on the income statement, isn't it? But we don't call it the income statement. We call it the statement of activities. Now, when we are at the government-wide level, we are using the economic resources measurement focus. We're using accrual accountability, accrual basis accounting, I should say, and we have an operational accountability focus. Three key th terms, okay? Now, let's first talk about um, accrual accounting. What is accrual accounting? Well, okay, it's who, who'd you have for accounting 100? <laughs> that's why I know, that's why I asked you. Oh, that, uh, right, incurring revenues, expenses, uh, recording them in what? In the period in which they occur, not necessarily in the period in which they're paid, right? Okay, so that's full accrual accounting, right? Full accrual accounting is the accounting you've known ever since you were two. When you were in the park, you were playing, and you saw somebody rushing, all stressed out, going somewhere, and you said, oh, mommy, mommy, what does that person do? That looks like fun. And your mom said, well, that's an accountant. Oh, I want to be that. That looks like so much fun, right? And so your mom said, okay, but promise you'll always use accrual accounting. And you said, okay, mommy, I promise. What's accrual accounting? And your mom said, well, if you buy what? A piece of equipment, you have to debit an asset called what? Equipment, whatever, for $1,000. And you have to credit cash for $1,000, assuming you paid cash for that, right? And you then take that equipment and you depreciate it, et cetera. And your mom took out the whiteboard and showed you all that. And you said, oh, oh, okay, I promise. I'll depreciate that. I'll do That's full of cool accounting, isn't it? Okay. So when we're at the government-wide level, we're going to be using accrual basis. We're going to be using economic resources measurement focus because what? Is equipment a economic resource? Is equipment an economic resource? 
So we're going to be keeping track of that and appreciating, et cetera, just like you've been doing in all your accounting classes up until now, right? When we're at the government-wide level. Operational accountability says, is this government efficient in providing the services that it's going to provide the citizens? Okay, so we have what? Accrual basis of accounting at the government-wide level. We're using economic resources, measurement focus at the government-wide level. We have an operational accountability focus. Okay, okay, good. Now, when we get to the fund level, we're going to have 11 different funds, and they are going to fall into three categories. One is the governmental funds, and the governmental funds will be constituted the general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, and the permanent fund. Okay, We will have something called proprietary funds. There are two of them. There is the internal service fund and the enterprise fund. And then we are going to have four what we call fiduciary funds. There's going to be the custodial funds, the investment trust fund, the private purpose trust fund, and the pension fund, constituting 11 different funds. We will take those 11 different funds and we will do what? Consolidate them into those government-wide statements, the two government-wide statements, a balance sheet and an income statement, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, this slide is important because it gives you, okay, come on, it gives you the easy way to sit here and remember the 11 funds. So we've got 11 funds, and you were like, John, how did you rattle those off like that without even looking at the slide? Because I remember the mnemonic grass, C, KIPP, and you don't need to worry about the PO part of KIPP, just the CIPP is KIPP, CIPP is KIPP, okay? So you have what? You have your governmental funds, and your governmental funds are what? The general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, and the permanent fund. Those are our five governmental funds, right? Okay. Then you have what? Then you have the proprietary funds. There are two of them. There is what? The internal service fund and the enterprise fund. And then you have, what, four fiduciary funds, the pension fund, the investment trust fund, the private purpose trust fund, and the, did I say custodial fund? The custodial fund, the investment trust fund, the private purpose trust fund, and the permanent, and, and the uh, um, pension fund. You have to know these 11 funds. Grass, C, KIPP. Grasp, C, KIPP. Okay? Now, we do what? We take the funds and we do what with them? We consolidate them into the government wide, don't we? That says consolidate, believe it or not. We take those funds and we consolidate them into the government wide, right? Okay, so what will we do? We will take our governmental funds plus one of the two proprietary funds, the internal service fund, and we will consolidate that into governmental activities. Okay. We will take our enterprise funds and we will consolidate that into something called business type activities. Our fiduciary funds are not reported, that's not a star, that's an X, are not reported at the government-wide level. 
So when we consolidate our funds, it's what? It's only seven funds. The five um, governmental funds plus one of the two proprietary funds are consolidated into a column called governmental activities. And then the what? Enterprise fund is reported at the government-wide level under a column called business type activity. The fiduciary funds are not consolidated up. The reason being that for our fiduciary funds or at our government-wide level, what kind of focus do we have? Operational accountability. Operational accountability is saying how efficient, how effective am I at providing services? These assets that we're reporting, these items that we're reporting here at the fiduciary fund level are items that the government is holding on somebody else's behalf. For example, the pension. Do the pension assets belong to the government or do they belong to the government employees? They belong to the government employees. So when we're talking about our fiduciary responsibility, yes, we report what's going on with the pension. When we're talking about what? An operational accountability focus, how efficient, how effective are we are providing services to the citizens, then how that pension fund is, is uh, performing is of no consequence to the government operations. So when we get to the government wide level, we do not include the fiduciary funds. We only include what? The governmental funds and the proprietary funds. Okay. Okay, question. Now, we're going to look more at this here in the next couple of slides, but I just want to point out to you on this summary slide right now. When we get into our governmental funds, notice governmental funds use modified accrual accounting current financial resources measurement focus. Now this is different than what we have said about the government-wide statements. Government-wide statements were full accrual economic resources, right? So there's going to be a different type of accounting and this is the part uh, that students find difficult with governmental accounting class is getting used to how we deal with modified accrual accounting. Modified accrual accounting has different rules in terms of how we account for certain transactions. For example, we're going to spend quite a bit of time in Chapter 4 looking at how the government accounts for its uh, revenue. Revenue recognition in a government is different than it would be in a corporation because the government just comes and says, give me your money, and you have to give it to them, don't they? Don't you? So we're going to have to learn a whole new set of recognition rules, right? Okay, as these governments uh, collect their revenue, et cetera, okay, impose the, their will on you, essentially. Okay, now, but let's just talk about an easy one. So, you told your mom you'd always use accrual accounting, right? And I'm here to tell you that you won't always use accrual accounting in this class. You will if you're the government-wide level, but if we're at the governmental fund level, if we purchase a piece of equipment, remember the road improvement thing? We're supposed to spend a million dollars, can only spend a million dollars on road improvement. Let's say we spend a thousand dollars on a steamroller. What's a steamroller? What's a steamroller? Yeah, it's that big truck, big tractor with a big round wheel on it that you just got your car washed and then you get behind one of those because it's spewing tar all over the place as it flattens out the road bed, right? Is that a piece of equipment you can use on road improvement? Okay, good. So when we spend that money, we don't have to debit expend it. I mean, to debit equipment, we can just debit expenditure. We would debit expenditure. We would credit cash for a thousand dollars because we can meet our accounting objective, which is: Did we spend the money in compliance with the laws and regulations? Didn't the law say that we're only supposed to spend a million dollars on road improvement? Did we spend a million dollars on road improvement? Can you now tell if this government spent the money in compliance with the laws? There will be no depreciation at our governmental fund level. Because we're doing what? We're treating this as an expenditure, aren't we? 
So there'll be no equipment, there'll be no depreciation. This is one of the key hallmark differences between full accrual and modified accrual, right? Okay, now remember I told you that at what? The government-wide level, we have to use full accrual, don't we? Government-wide level, okay? So what's going to happen? When we prepare our government-wide balance sheet, we'll show equipment. of a thousand we'll show assuming no liabilities we'll show net position of a thousand right for the balance sheet does the balance sheet have to balance does the balance sheet have to balance yes. what do we do to a balance sheet that doesn't balance we beat it until it does as accountants right the balance sheet will balance okay all right so what happens the balance sheet is balancing because our assets are equaling our, our stockholders equities essentially our net position right Okay, if we had this only one transaction that affected this government the whole period, right, then what would happen? We would have started out with $1,000 cash when we spent that cash. Cash is zero and the net position is 1000 right? Okay, now when we're sitting here and we spend that cash, our cash is now what? Our cash is now zero. Our equity, which we call fund balance, will be zero because we would have had an expenditure of a thousand if we started out with a thousand dollars cash we'd have a fund balance of a thousand but if we spent the cash and we had an expenditure if fund balances like retained earnings we'd only have that expenditure of a thousand dollars fund balance would go down to zero wouldn't it just like retained earnings would go down to zero if all you had was an expenditure of a thousand okay so does this balance sheet balance does this balance sheet balance both these balance sheets balance don't they but the users of the financial statements are saying, I don't understand the relationship between the fund financial statements and the government-wide statements because one is showing an equity-type thing called fund balance as zero. The other is showing a what? Equity-type thing, retained earnings called net position of 1,000. So that statement that I was talking to you about that we'll learn more about in Chapter 8 is called a reconciliation in which we'll start with fund balance of zero and then we'll simply say hey we got equipment at the government wide level don't we of a thousand and it'll take that thousand and add it back what's the net position how much is the net position at the government wide level thousand now a user can understand that little double arrow that went back and forth that said what hey we're sitting here and at the fund level, it's zero. At the government wide level, it's what? A thousand. The reason is because there's equipment being reported at the government wide level that isn't reported at the fund level under the modified accrual basis of accounting, right? Okay, now we'll talk more about that. But right now, you should be taking in that what? When we're at the government wide level, full accrual. When we're at what? When we're at the governmental fund level, we're using what? Modified accrual, current financial resources measurement focus because what? Look how we treat things like equipment. We treat things like equipment as an expense, don't we? So we're only looking at current financial resources, not long-term items. So that's why you see here what? When we're at the fund level, no fixed assets, no long-term liabilities, no fixed assets, no depreciation, right? Okay. Now, as we move to our proprietary funds and our fiduciary funds, we will turn back to full accrual accounting. So the only time you use modified accrual current financial resources is if we're talking about what? Our governmental funds. The general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, right? Yes, sir. Well, it's not that they can't do fixed assets, it's that they don't do fixed assets, okay? And they don't do fixed assets, they don't report them, because we just simply want to see that what? Money was spent for the intended purpose in compliance with what? In compliance with laws and budgetary constraints, etc. That's the purpose of this level of reporting. And since that's the purpose of this level of reporting, we just want to show, hey, we spent the money and we spent it for the right purpose, road improvement. 
We're, we, we've met our accountability objective. We're done. We're not here trying to show how do we determine net income, et cetera. Okay? So when you're down here and you have a fiscal accountability, then you don't have to worry about reporting these assets and depreciating them in that because you just want to show, hey, did I carry out my, my fiscal responsibility? which is what we're doing with these fund statements. This is, even though they didn't put it here, this is a fiscal accountability. And now I gotta change my pen to pen, and then I gotta change it to red. Okay, so this is a fiscal accountability here. Fiscal, that says F-I-S-C-A-L. Fiscal accountability, fiscal accountability. When we're down here, we have an operational accountability, which means are we efficient, are we effective? Then what? Then things like depreciation and that start to become important. We move to full accrual accounting and we'll depreciate it. We'll record our assets for one and we'll depreciate them. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you can see that this is the statement of net position. This is our consolidated government-wide statement. Consolidated government-wide statement. And when you look at this thing, we have two columns, governmental activities and business type activities, right? Two columns, governmental activities, business type activities. And that corresponds to what we saw over here, governmental activities and business type activities at our government wide level, right? Okay, but right here, we are looking at the statement of net position, which is our government wide statement. This is a government wide consolidated statement in which we did what? We took our governmental funds, which is the general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, and permanent fund. That corresponds to the mnemonic over here, GRASP, plus the what? S N C Pappy, the internal service fund, which I wrote ISF, and we consolidated it here in the governmental activities. Then we took what? Then we took our enterprise funds and we did what? Consolidated them under the business type activity. That's why I wrote that big E over there. Where's the KIP funds? Good. KIP funds are not reported at the government-wide level under the operational accountability focus, right? So we would just leave them off. Now, what type of accounting are we using on this statement? Full accrual accounting. So we're going to have what? Long-term capital assets, aren't we? Both current and non-current assets. We're going to have what? We're going to have, well, we don't report... Uh, we're reporting a net of accumulated depreciation, okay, but depreciation expenses on the income statement, right? Okay, but we've got our what? We've got our capital assets. Where I was going is we've got non-current liabilities, right? Full accrual accounting. When we were over here, we were looking at our funds, and we were seeing that our for our funds, we had what? We only had current items, right? But here we're at the government-wide level. Government-wide level, yes, we will report fixed assets. We will report long-term liabilities, right, under full accrual accounting? Okay. Okay, good. And then we have our net position. Net position is like what? Good. Net position is L-I-K-E, like what? Like retain earnings. Good. And we'll talk about the different categories that we're going to put our retained earnings in a little bit later. I don't want to get into that right now because I don't want your head to explode. Okay, but there's different categories that we report our retained earnings. But right now, government-wide statement, we have what? We have two columns, governmental activities, business type activities. We take all of our governmental funds and we put them in the governmental activities. No shock, right? We take our internal service fund and we put it in the governmental activities as well. We take our what? Our enterprise funds and we put them where? In the business type activity. Where's the KIP funds? Not reported at the government wide level. Good. Excellent. Okay. Now, here we're looking at the statement of 
uh, net position for our proprietary funds. Okay, now our proprietary funds are what? They are one of our fund categories, aren't they? Proprietary funds? Okay, and so when you look at our proprietary fund statement, notice that we have what? We have the enterprise funds and we have the internal service fund being reported here. Okay, now when you total up my enterprise funds, this one has two enterprise funds. Enterprise funds are like a business being run inside the government. And when we say a business being run inside the government, meaning that the uh, individual pays a fee and they get a service back. So when you park at the city parking, if you park your car without paying a fee, what happens? You get a ticket or something. You've got to pay to use that service, don't you? If you don't pay your water bill, what happens? They shut it off, okay? You, you know, they don't care that you've got soap in your eyes. They'll shut you off right while you're in the shower. You're washing your hair. You're getting ready for a big date. And boom, they cut the water off. You say, help, wait. They say, too bad. You didn't pay the bill, right? That's like a business, isn't it? Okay, so we call that a proprietary fund. We include those proprietary funds in the business type activities. Now, you add those up, and that gives us the totals. And so when you come over, you have your totals for your uh, proprietary funds, current and non-current items. Okay, and then you come over, and you come over to the total of the funds net position, this is my uh, my uh, enterprise funds, I should say, added together, and that gives me a total of what? 1,835,000 for the net position, and I'm supposed to take those enterprise funds and do what? Report them at the government-wide level under business type activities, right? I'm supposed to consolidate them and report them under business type activities. So when I come over now, to my, oops, when I come over, or back, I guess, to my government-wide statement, and I go to the business type activity column, is it true that I'm reporting 1835000 of net position at the government-wide level? Is that the same number? Is 1835000 the same number? Same number? So did we lie that we took the enterprise funds and consolidated them and reported them under that business type activity column? It's not a lie. It ties, doesn't it? Okay. Now, I can't do the same for the governmental activities because what? I'd have to show you and you'd have to understand the full reconciliation of all the things that constitute the difference between modified accrual, accrual accounting and full accrual accounting. And I would be a genius as a teacher if I could teach you that just here tonight because there are quite a few differences that we're going to understand as we go through the class. And then we'll be able to what? reconcile the fund balance, which is reported at the fund level, to the net position that is reported on the governmental activities column, right? Because we're going to have to make all kinds of adjustments. Okay. So for right now, all you need to understand is that what? We have this slide, which tells us what? Well, maybe this slide too. Okay, but this slide is a picture of what that slide is telling you, that we have 11 funds. Five of them are what? Governmental funds. What are they? General fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, right? We have two proprietary funds, an internal service fund, S, an enterprise fund, E, and then we have fiduciary funds, which are what? KIP, custodial investment trust fund, private purpose trust fund, and the pension fund, right? Okay, that constitutes our funds. We take those and we do what? Consolidate them at the government-wide level. Government-wide level, we have what? We have the governmental activities and the business-type activities. We take all of our governmental funds, no-brainer, and put it what? 
governmental activities, we need to remember, and I'll explain why later when we have more time to talk about it uh, next time probably, we'll take our what? We'll take our internal service fund and put it with a governmental fund. So even though it's a proprietary fund at the fund level, it goes in governmental activities at the government wide level, right? And then we take our enterprise funds, however many we have. In the example I showed you, we had two, whatever, we could have three, we could have 10. We sit there and we do what? consolidate them and report them under the business type activity column at the government wide level, right? What about my KIPP funds? Not reported at the government wide level, right? Okay. The other thing that we want to get used to, start getting used to is that what? When we're at the government wide level, we use what? Full accrual accounting, economic resources measurement focus, operational accountability, right? When we're at the fund level, it is what? depending on what category of fund we're in. Governmental funds use modified accrual, current financial resources, and fiscal accountability. And the big difference right now is what? When we spend money on long-term items, we're going to debit expenditure, not debit an asset account. There's other differences we're going to be going through, guys, but that's a good one to remember right now is a difference, right? Okay. When we deal with our what? When we deal with our proprietary fund, our fiduciary fund category, we're back to full accrual accounting, right? So the only time you have to make your mom upset is when you are dealing with the governmental funds. That's when you won't use full accrual accounting, right? Everybody else uses accrual accounting? Okay. Okay, good. We will stop there. And what we will start to do next time is get into a little bit more detail as to the nature of activity that goes on in these various funds, our governmental funds, our proprietary funds, our fiduciary funds, et cetera. Okay? So you should be getting on to iLearn, getting these slides, okay, e-learning, whatever, getting these slides, starting to mark these slides up with me as I go along. Your best bet is to do that. I see people writing in notebooks, and I think to myself, you will never see that note again. If you have the slides where I've already written and I'm adding different additional things on, now it's all organized in the manner of the lecture, right? And then you can always go back and find the lecture part where you didn't quite get what you wanted on that slide, find where it is, take a look, adjust accordingly, and we'll do the same thing with the quizzes. So bring the quiz, too. I'd print the slides out, I'd print the quiz out, or bring it on your tablet so you can note as we go along. Okay? All right, guys, I will see you next time. All right, let me um, do one thing, okay, because um, I've got this uh, recording going, and so I want to stop the recording so that our conversation doesn't get recorded. <laughs>